while we wait the end of time and the technical, uh, the technical solutions here, what we're going to do is flip the addresses. Uh, Dr. David Wagshaw, a new faculty member at uh, Trinity, is going to, is to speak second, will speak first. By the time he's finished, either the end of times will come or we will fix the problem. Yes, thank you. You know, I had, had, I had prepared a, a PowerPoint this morning, but it was really one of those sort of vanity PowerPoints with just an outline, so I think it's not really necessary. Um, my topic today is the fundamental ecclesiological issues, of course, between Orthodox and Anglicans. Uh, today, I want to address this uh, topic, uh, which is actually in some ways a fairly well-worn topic. I want to address it uh, in a bit of a different fashion. I want to look not so much at this uh, topic as a kind of uh, exposition through an exposition of doctrine uh, or even specific disciplinary usages, but I want to sort of uh, step back a little bit and do more of a kind of big picture uh, type survey of um, sort of the overall shape, as it were, of our two traditions, the, the cultures of our churches, some of the sort of sociological structures and frameworks, uh, factors that mm, constitute uh, the kind of um, uh, scaffolding, as it were, for how we think and behave as church. Fundamental points of reference, uh, assumptions, implicit, explicit, uh, that undergird our articulations of our identity uh, and how we perceive and receive others. And my starting point uh, for this discussion is really an observation that a, that a lot of us who have been around ecumenical circles for some time uh, or who simply had a mutual experience of, between the Anglican and Orthodox churches uh, well know, and that's that there's a, there's a real affinity, actually, between the Orthodox and Anglican traditions. There's a real set of resonances. Um, there's dissonances, too, uh, but there's many points of resonance. Um, and the symptoms of this, as it were, are all over the place, little things, but revealing things. Uh, do you notice, for example, how often it is that Orthodox parishes that don't have facilities yet or their missions or so forth uh, end up in Anglican churches. It's extremely common. I was trying to name some from the top of my head, and I named about ten of them easily. Uh, there's a kind of flow and movement of converts between the two churches. Uh, it's very well known in Orthodoxy. Many, we have many prominent converts uh, from the Anglican church, and also people who might be coming from, say, more evangelical tradition or perhaps no Christian tradition will sometimes first become Anglican and then become Orthodox. It's kind of like a, a stop on the, on the way, as it were. Uh, but it goes the other way as well. Uh, there are Orthodox who move into Anglicanism uh, for a variety uh, of reasons as well. So there's a kind of movement between the two churches. Um, of course... There's a mutual influence on the two churches. Uh, last night we were looking at, uh, of course, some specific instances of this. This is today a fairly, fairly wide-reaching, at least in the sense that people, I think a lot of Anglicans, more so than I think people from other uh, churches, and maybe not more so, maybe Lutherans and Catholics are to some extent the same amount, but I think even more with Anglicans, do actually read Orthodox literature, you know, um, at least popular things, uh, but even uh, Orthodox patristic literature as well. And the opposite is also true. Uh, particularly among Western Orthodox. It's not uncommon uh, to find Orthodox, uh, particularly in North America, you know, who are, who are rather uh, deeply influenced by people like uh, C.S. Lewis, of course, who's actually wildly popular in a lot of Orthodox circles, uh, but others, you know, Dunn, Coleridge, um, some of these people, of course, Chesterton, I mean, he ended up as Catholic, but um, uh, Newman, another one that ended up as Catholic, but nevertheless, um, you know, the, these people are actually read. T.S. Eliot's um, Underhill, uh, people read Underhill. Um, so there is this kind of uh, affinity between us. But now, very few people really look at and try to identify what the roots of this are. And what I want to do today is to take a, take a just a, in a sort of a massively broad stroke, just look at a few big, big factors um, that I think uh, contribute to this, so sort of points of resonance and also a few points of dissonance. And I'm coming at this uh, as a church historian, which I think will be sort of Evident. My actual field is canon law. Um, uh, I actually won't get too much into law. I, I want to look at three areas in particular. This would have been my grand PowerPoint. Uh, the first one is the way we do theology. Questions for the method of theology, the how of theology. The second one I want to look at are questions of infrastructure. Um, that is the sort of institutional sociological realities of our churches. Um, and then I want to look at something a little more synthetic, which I would call the legacy of empire, which I think both of us share. 
and has had interesting effects on both of us. And then, if we have time, which we almost certainly won't, I want to engage also in a little bit of critical assessment of some of these features and characteristics. I want to ask, uh, how do these features, these characteristics shared or not, uh, really equip us for our mission today, uh, for what we're doing as churches? I think for both of our traditions, we share some traps. I think one of our traps is that sometimes we, we like to um, sort of marvel at our own historical particularities a little bit too much and sort of you know, revel in the, the wonders of our uh, historical uh, uh, specialness and so forth. Um, but I do want to say, you know, what's a liability here? What's a weakness? What's a strength? Uh, what's an asset uh, as we're moving forward? So in other words, I want to look at sort of the broad shapes of our church, but I also want to look at you know, what shape we're in, as it were. Right. So let's begin. Uh, first of all, the way of theology, the how of theology, how do we do theology? This, I think, is a point of consonance, a point of real resonance, and where the source of a lot of this sort of diffuse affinity that is felt between many Anglicans and Orthodox. Um, our contents of our theology may be very different, but there is something similar to how we approach it as a task. And I think there's two aspects of this resonance. And the first one is very obvious, and really we were talking about it yesterday. Um, and this, of course, is the centrality and primacy of liturgy in our two traditions. This is so obvious I won't spend that much time on it. But, you know, if you want to point to a similarity between our churches, uh, the place of liturgy and more broadly the strong valuation of an aesthetics of worship as an essential, integral part of theology itself and our identity would probably be one of the first things you think about between the two churches. The centrality of formal liturgical worship uh, in the imagination, the life, the theology of our two churches is, I think, unparalleled, actually. Uh, of course, here, actually, you know, parentheses, you know, which Anglican tradition I'm talking about. As usual for Orthodox, I'm thinking of the more higher church traditions because that's usually who we meet. So, I mean, there's a little caveat there. And I should also say, when I'm talking about the Orthodox, I tend to be talking more about the Orthodox in the West. But anyway, we'll continue with that little caveat out of the way. Now, of course, worship is important in all churches. But I think in the Orthodox and Anglican communions, uh, the attachment to specific historical traditional form of liturgy goes further than in most. It's a kind of pillar of identity itself. It's actually a source of theology, a touchstone for orthodoxy. Um, liturgy has become invested in, exp uh, in expressing and defining the church and its belief itself. Uh, Darmaid McCullough has a very little interesting comment in his uh, History of the Reformation. You know, looking at this sort of, this puzzle of the Church of England, you know, this sort of perennial problem of, you know, why does the Church of England, the Reformation sort of seems to start relatively normal, re normally really, through Edward VI, but it sort of stops, you know, it seems to sort of get halfway and you get this very interesting um, sort of middle Reformation type church. Why? What, what's so different about the English experience? Well, one of the things he points to, he says one thing that's rather unique about the English development was the survival of these cathedral uh, and collegiate churches and their, 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 their infrastructure um, uh, in total, you know, in total, and the continuation in particular of the strong choral traditions. I think that's very interesting. I mean, the suggestion is that this, this experience somehow sort of nourished a continuing uh, devotion and desire for a broader continuity with the medieval church. Um, and so it encouraged a sort of strong aesthetic sensibility that somehow resisted a full-fledged reformation on the more continental reformed model. I think, well, maybe, maybe not, but whatever the case, <laughs> there is no question that the Anglican Church has since developed, um, as it has developed, the Book of Common Prayer has been a central uh, focus and instrument in the negotiation of the Church's belief and identity. There's no question about that. You can almost do the history of Anglican doctrine uh, through tracking the Book of Common Prayer, and Anglicans themselves think of it that way, uh, in my experience. It's a kind of gauge, as it were, um, for the mind of the Church. Uh, and because of this, uh, the church has developed, actually, until quite recently, I mean, really quite recently, a remarkable attachment um, to the Book of Common Prayer um, and shows a marked liturgical conservatism in all sorts of even small ways, I mean, in language, uh, more so than I think just about any other Reformed church does. Well, all of this, of course, is very much par paralleled in the Orthodox churches with their extraordinary attachment and veneration of the liturgies of St. John Chrysostom and St. Basil. Uh, which, again, we have an immense sort of conservatism. We basically celebrate them in a form almost identical to the late medieval period. Um, 
Uh, and we very much approach liturgy as a sort of central document, a uh, doctrinal monument of orthodoxy. Yaroslav Pelikan, in his book on creeds, uh, did a rather nice thing in the orthodox section. You know, he puts in the traditional creeds and some of the later confessional documents, and then he just throws in the liturgy of uh, St. Basil, I think. He just sort of, poof, there it is, a sort of creed of the orthodox church. Um, I think most orthodox would approve of that. I suspect that at least in some Anglican circles, you could have done almost the same thing with sort of the, maybe the 1662 Book of Common Prayer or parts of it. Um, but the truth is we do both basically approach our liturgies as quasi-confessional documents so we are deeply, deeply uh, invested in the notion of lex orandi and lex credendi right, again I think that's rather well known so I'll, I'll move on to the second aspect now this strong aspect this strong sense of the lex orandi, lex credendi the rule of prayer is the rule of truth um, of belief uh, is closely connected to, I think, the second resonance between the Orthodox and Anglicans. And this is what I would call their sort of mutual allergy to really systematic, propositional, classical, confessional modes of theological discourse. Um, what I mean by this is that neither church is particularly inclined to self-describing with precise, exhaustive, comprehensive, systematic expositions of the type that starts to develop in the 16th century and ever since. Um, there are, of course, confessional elements to both churches, creeds, 39 articles, so forth. But compared to developments in other churches, especially the Catholics and the Reformed, the Orthodox and Anglicans are actually very minimalistic in this regard. We don't really have an official systematic theology to compare to Aquinas or, or the Catholic Catechism. Uh, there's not really a synthesis of the st uh, stature and position and scope of Calvin's institutes in either church. And actually, there's not really a clear magisterial process in either church as well. It's awfully fuzzy. If you want to sort of find the answer to one question or another, what is the, the answer of the Orthodox, the Anglicans, it's often a little hard to do, actually. This frustrates Orthodox converts to no end. They're often look at, they frequently ask me, you know, where's the book I look for for the answer? Instead, both Anglicans and Orthodox, we seem to be able to tolerate a surprising amount of sort of theological messiness and variability. Uh, it's not that we're not necessarily uh, lukewarm necessarily on various points of doctrine. It's just that theology doesn't exactly work in a completely uniform mechanistic propositional way. It's not a kind of logical puzzle. And what I think is going on here, I would suggest, is actually a kind of theological archaicism in both of the churches. We're kind of the theological throwbacks in this regard. Um, in effect, both of us are continuing a kind of pre-modern mode of theological discourse, which is much more literary um, and traditional in character. It's much more about the process um, of engaging with a kind of a huge networks of semi-sacred authorities and bringing them into various interactions with each other and so forth, more so than just sort of distilling one unitary set of propositional conclusions from the traditions. Um, in this respect, by the way, I, I do think the Anglican Church really is sort of the oldest church of the West. You know, I think that sense the Anglican Church has of being that kind of legitimate uh, continuator of the medieval church in terms of theological method uh, is really true, and I think that's a deep, deep uh, point of affinity with the East. And, and so with magisterial authority, it's, it's really, you know, it's really hard to find a, a really clear formal principle of magisterial authority uh, in, in either tradition. There's huge sets of markers, um, but none really holds def absolutely definitive authority. Um, theology is instead a kind of slow, polyvalent meditation on the whole tradition itself about weighing and sorting through and kind of ruminating over this huge collective past. It's complex, it's long, and it defies type summary. One aspect of this, that, uh, sort of a more specific point of resonance, is the kind of patristic th uh, character of both Anglican and Orthodox theology. And I don't just mean that uh, the Anglicans have been very interested in the fathers of the 4th, 5th, 6th century. I mean that the way that Anglicans kind of structure their own theological landscape is very much through these big figures, the, the, the notion of the Anglican divines. There's a kind of pantheon of patristic figures. That, it's exactly what the Orthodox, too. You know, it's about the individual opera of all of these uh, great figures, uh, you know, Hooker and Andrew and, uh, and on and on. So there's a kind of similar shape there, as it were, to how the theological geography um, has been uh, slowly molded. Right. Moving on to the second point. Uh, infrastructure. This is to move now to a point of dissonance. You know, there's many, many ways we can look at what sort of the, the big differences are between uh, the two churches. Um, 
Generally, I think when we do this, and particularly looking at the Anglican tradition, I think we think, okay, what makes it different from the medieval tradition and the Orthodox tradition? We think about the reformed elements within the Anglican Church. Um, and I think when Anglicans, you know, when they're asked what makes their church particularly reformed, um, well, I'm sure there's many different answers, and you can uh, inform me of that afterwards, but um, in my experience, they, generally speaking, they point somehow to Scripture. It's about Scripture, the preeminence of Scripture, its place, the emphasis on the preaching of the Word, uh, perhaps then also a kind of conversion, the appropriation of this Word with conviction and so forth. But it's all very much about Scripture. Um, well, there, there, I'm sure there's some truth to that. Um, but from my perspective, as a church historian, and particularly as an, I'm basically an early medieval historian uh, for the first millennium, when I think about what really makes the Anglican Church a reformed church, and what really marks it off from orthodoxy, and the medieval church actually, it's not scripture or a doctrine of scripture per se, um, it's something else. And that something else is really monasticism. And in particular, it's absence. Um, it's really hard to overstate what a difference this, of course I'm aware that since the 19th century there has been a revival of monasticism with the Anglican Church, but it's nothing uh, compared to the place that monasticism has uh, in the Orthodox East and the Catholic Church. It's a very pervasive, all-embracing element of church life in the Orthodox world. Uh, and in fact, the Orthodox world, uh, since the 15th century and before this even, uh, has in fact increasingly monasticized. Our hierarchy has become, at least in theory, monastic. Our liturgy became monastic, or monasticized. Uh, the last great theological movement in Byzantine Hesychism was a monastic movement. Uh, much of our devotional life has been borrowed from monasticism, Jesus' prayer, for example. Uh, many monastic institutions, such as the spiritual father, have now become very widespread in orthodoxy. That was not the case in the first millennium. Um, very much of, in fact, what people today encounter in orthodox and think of as orthodox is in fact orthodox monastic theology. Mystical theology, the virtue and vice type theology and so on. And it is in fact very rare within the modern Orthodox world to find active laity, uh, secular clergy or theologians, that have not been quite profoundly influenced somehow by a monastery uh, or a monastic uh, spiritual father. Um, monasticism is in fact a very complex synthetic phenomenon. You know, it's not just sort of one sociological option of lifestyle as it were. It's not just an institution. There's a whole culture that goes with it, a whole ethos, and in fact, a whole theology. And I often think that it's somewhat underappreciated that the, the genius of the Reformation, and particularly of Luther himself, and I think, I'm not sure Reformation scholars always, because it's like coming from such a medieval background, this is so apparent to them, but the, uh, the genius of it, hate it or love it, was that he basically extracted that entire synthesis, as it were, out of the church. Um, which is a kind of amazing feat, really. Um, you know, his doctrine of justification by grace alone really pulled out the rug from the whole sort of theological rationale and theological instinct of, of a sort of Christian life as advancement of progress, of process, of climbing, uh, all of which is very integral to monastic theology. And with all of that, of course, goes the sort of complex devotional practices, uh, the complex, very complex psychological introspection of the tradition, uh, the whole discourse of virtue and vice and spiritual exercise, the whole sacramental system, in a sense, you know, understood as kind of fuel for the journey, that kind of, you know, giving you uh, something else as you're moving onwards and upwards. Uh, the whole doctrine of, of faith as a kind of passive, passive acceptance and trust instead of a kind of um, intellectual act really pulled the feet up from sort of the active contemplative uh, tradition as well, or you could see it that way at least. Um, and then, of course, you have other things. I mean, the whole sort of sexual revolution. I mean, the whole thing, the whole notion that celibacy is really not superior to marriage. I mean, that is a radical idea, which is not just upending Christian tradition. It's upending the classical tradition. I mean, that's the, that's the Greco-Roman heritage that's also being pulled up. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot going on. Uh, and again, you know, love it or hate it, I think that was sort of that whole structure, in a sense, gets pulled out um, in particularly the Lutheran wing and to some extent the Calvinists. Now the Anglicans, of course, uh, despite dissolution itself, um, did not go, as typical, for this kind of wholesale deracination, as it were, 
from the monastic tradition. And so, in fact, it has many elements of this monastic synthesis that have, I think, been retained. Um, there's much sort of stronger devotional, contemplative, mystical literature, uh, probably uh, aspects of liturgical culture, uh, a much more uh, robust discourse, I think, of virtue and vice and so on. But nevertheless, the absence of the structure as a whole, I think, is one of the great, great points of dissonance between the two traditions. Now, this contrast is actually made stronger, moving on to my second point of dissonance in infrastructure, uh, when we realize that Anglicanism has been very much, has taken shape and been very much formed by another institution, but one that has had correspondingly very little influence in the modern Orthodox world, at least, well, really for the last uh, five centuries for sure. Um, and this is the university. Right, so these are the two points, monasticism and university. Um, the impact of the university and academia on Anglicanism, I think, is quite profound, although many of you probably take it for granted. Um, as an outsider to Anglicanism, I have to say that the sort of scholarly, learned nature of Anglicanism and of its discourse is one of the things that's always struck me as one of its real distinctive features. And, you know, you look down the list of the Anglican fathers, you know, the Anglican divines, and it's amazing how many of them were, if, you know, in fact, real academics or researchers, but, or just very, very learned people. I mean, really, Cranmer, Hooker, Parker, Andrews, Cousin, Usher, Law, Taylor, Butler, Kebble, Pusey, Newman, Lightfoot, Westcott, Hort. These are, I mean, these are just the ones that you know, coming to the top of my mind. You know, of course, I'm not terribly well. And this continues today. I mean, someone like Rowan Williams, you know, who is considered a major authority in you know, Eastern Church theology and is also you know, what was the you know, Archbishop of Canterbury. And there's a quality of Anglican spiritual writing, too, I think, that this, that this affects. It's uh, quite recherché. I mean, it's quite learned. Um, it's scholarly. Um, but it's important to know that this sort of learned academic nature of Anglicanism doesn't, is not the kind of dryness, I think, that's often sort of conjured by the word academic today when we say Anglicanism is kind of academic. Uh, because it's, it, it's been, Anglicanism has been shaped by one particular type of academic life, and that, of course, has been the British Academy. Yeah? Um, which, at least until very recently, had been exceptionally generous, you know, and literary in its character and expression, very broad interests and horizons, synthetic. It doesn't have that kind of super professionalized, technocratic uh, quality of, of, of more the German Academy, for example. And I think in theology, it's been, it's been the reality that many of the academic positions the church been, have held have also overlapped with pastoral charges uh, in practice. And the result of this, I think, is that um, uh, this has really produced a very interesting quality or flavor of, can I say, sort of academic pastorship uh, in, the academic, in the Anglican Church that I think has really very little close correspondence anywhere else. I think the Anglicans have produced what's really very hard to produce, um, that rare type of church leader who is actually both learned and practical. Um, and at times, of course, this, this produces even that sort of inimitably Anglican type of churchman, the kind of refined scholar mystic, if I can say um, such a thing. Uh, in orthodoxy, needless to say, the relationship with the university has been rather fraught, and for a very simple reason, uh, the university, the encounter with the academy, the encounter with the university has always been uh, at the same moment, an encounter with the West. It's been an encounter with the other. Either we're sending people to the West to get educated, and half the time they convert, but then they sort of come back to Padua, uh, all over Europe. Uh, or when the universities finally do come into Eastern and Southern Europe, which doesn't really happen until actually the late 19th century, uh, it's still something sort of, it, it's being done entirely on the model of Western universities, especially German. Uh, and it's some, it tends to sit in the tradition of something a bit alien, as a kind of a fifth column. And so we tend to get a kind of structural tension between the academy and other life of the church, and particularly between the academy and the sort of more monastic tradition. Uh, right. So I think that um, the symbiosis, as it were, that's been worked out within the Anglican tradition is really quite remarkable. Okay. I want to move now to the, the third point, moving right along because we're rather uh, late here. Um, what I call the legacy of empire. Um, this is again, I think, a point of resonance, of consonance between us, uh, although one that might cause us a little bit of anxiety today. I'm not sure we're always happy about this one. Um, that's what I would call the imperial nature of our churches. Um, both of our churches are very much churches of empire, and I mean this in two senses. First of all, uh, we are, as it were, children of empire. And I mean children of the empire. 
the Roman Empire. We are all the direct lineal descendants, of course, of the Constantinian Church, i.e. of the established Church of the Roman Empire, the great imperial synthesis of Christianity uh, that, that forms, of course, especially between the 4th and 6th century. Now, actually, virtually all surviving churches today really are descendants of the imperial church. Uh, but our relationship to this legacy is similar in that I think we still more or less readily cultivate uh, and identify with this synthesis. We are a little more positive toward the synthesis. Um, and we will, at least sections of us, <laughs> will proclaim a certain continuity and try to continue its forms. And we tend to see this as valuable and even as constituting an essential part of orthodoxy to continue uh, this kind of imperial synthesis. This is much more true in the Orthodox Church than the Anglican Church. The Orthodox Church can almost be viewed as kind of the fossilized late antique church in many respects. Um, but if you look at others, I mean, you know, other traditions, of course, have come from the imperial church but have rejected it almost wholesale, the Anabaptists. Uh, many have rejected large parts of it, the Lutherans, the Reformed. Uh, others, the Catholics, have really massively transformed it, actually, I think. And, and so it's something rather different. Uh, they live a kind of medieval version of it, as it were. But we're much more directly attached to it, I think. Uh, and we share many aspects of it. Now, there's many, again, different points I could draw out here. But the one that I think is really important today uh, is the whole idea of the established church. Um, the idea that the church is and should be intimately inter intertwined with the social political fabric of a nation or a state. Uh, that it's normal, desirable, certainly acceptable for the church to enter actively into the social and political life of states. To exercise considerable influence there. Uh, to enjoy privileges, to foster a close um, friendship, as it were, a close uh, identity, a fellowship between citizenship and church belonging, often even identifying those two, and so on. Um, now, both of our traditions, of course, have had uh, internal critiques of this relationship. Um, we've nuanced it in many ways. We have elements within our church that militate against it. But nevertheless, I think it is a very clear point of resonance between our two churches that in terms of historical experiences, our churches have very much existed as precisely large, institutionally elaborate uh, establishments of state. Uh, this really has been our kind of natural mode of existence throughout most of our history. Um, and as a result, I think we share a lot of habits, a lot of instincts in, in our relating to society and our relating to governments and so forth. Uh, we could point to many of these. Um, I'll just relate a sort of practical one that I've noticed within ecumenical circles is that Anglicans and Orthodox, we often relate to civil authorities in a similar way. Uh, we like them <laughs> for the most part. Um, we value contacts with them. We have an event, we like to have someone present, you know, some authority, some dignitary. We like letters from, I don't know, the Governor General and Prime Ministers and so on and so forth, right? This is something we value. Um, we almost get a kind of validation or legitimacy from it. And we like to, uh, you know, we like to actually sort of interpenetrate and consort with social, cultural, and political elites. We like to kind of, you know, be part of, we like to be players in a sense, you know, part of the system. That's kind of the natural mode for us. Um, as a result, we both tend to be kind of politically mainstream, actually. Uh, we have this sense of sort of working slowly and responsibly in the civil arena and so forth. Uh, so again, we have this kind of same, uh, it's the same sort of texture of our relationship. And I, I never noticed how unusual it is, in a sense, until I noticed other churches not doing it. Uh, particularly when I was working in the States, uh, at the National Council of Churches. Um, uh, whereas, again, the Orthodox and Anglicans tend to sort of work in that mode. It was interesting to see other churches that were actually much larger and much more powerful and much more able to actually bring down the attention of political authorities not being interested in doing it or not nearly so much, the Methodists, the Lutherans, mm, more distant, you know? You don't necessarily want. So I think that's, that's, a, I think that's a very interesting. We have a kind of similar position in society. I think this is why you do get Orthodox converts to Anglicanism. You know, when Orthodox will move to a city, there's no Orthodox churches. They'll go to the Anglican church because there's a sense that, you know, every nation has its church. So I've now become Canadian. I'm going to go to the, the Canadian church, you know, the established church. And so there's a natural familiarity. So that was the sort of first sense of, of us being imperial. Uh, the second sense that we're imperial, I think, is a more generic one. Uh, I mean by this that both of our churches have simply spent a fair bit of our lives actually as part of actual empires. Um, and this has been rather formative for us. 
Uh, this is much more true of the Orthodox than the Anglicans. I mean, Byzantine Orthodoxy, broadly speaking, has almost entirely lived in empires. The Roman Byzantine Empire, then the Russian Ottoman Empires, even more recently and sort of perversely, but sort of following the same theme, the Soviet Empire. Uh, we've lived in these sort of big, multinational, multi-ethnic polities. Anglicans, of course, don't really start as a sort of church of empire, uh, but they do end up as one. I mean, uh, you know, Anglican is, of course, global Anglicanism growing very much uh, on the back of and part of the British Empire. There's no question. Um, I think that living in empire has affected our idea of church in numerous ways. Um, most controversially, of course, it's affected our approach to mission, uh, which we have tended to uh, engage in sort of hand in hand with imperial conquest, politically, cultural, and otherwise. Uh, but more positively, uh, there's a kind of similar mm, breadth of vision, I would almost say, imagination. Um, I think we both tend to conceive our churches as able to encompass a very large variety of nations, customs, and so forth. Um, you see this, of course, in the Byzantine church in, the, in the, the old missions to the east, the Byzantine churches indigenizing missions to the Slavs, the Russian missions to the Permians, the Alaskans in English America, and so forth. And, of course, in all the Anglican international missions. Um, there's a kind of at least notional openness and expansiveness of vision. I think as a result, we also tend to think of ourselves as a kind of center reality. In both churches, there's a certain sense of trying to sort of seek the center, center of the value of balance, of breadth, of sort of looking for the middle. Of course, this is very evident in Anglicanism. Uh, the tendency is well known with the notion of the via media, um, almost becoming a kind of denominational brand, as it were. Um, this, of course, has its origin long before the Church of England became a church of empire, but I think this imperial experience has, has encouraged and nourished this instinct. But in orthodoxy, too, even though it's not so visible today, because we've tended now to take on a very Eastern identity, right? Uh, and in doing so, we've kind of internalized a Western view of ourselves, actually. Um, you know, we tend to sort of think of ourselves and even present ourselves as a kind of foreign and exotic margin, as it were, as opposed to a center. Um, but this is very far from traditional Byzantine self-perception. Uh, the Byzantines may have thought of themselves as Eastern, uh, but they never thought of themselves as an exotic mar uh, margin. Uh, quite to the contrary, the Byzantines were always completely convinced that they were the center of the world. Um, and whatever we might think of that today, it is actually remarkable how often Byzantine church culture does actually read as sort of seeking a center, a kind of balance, as a synthesis of many different elements. Uh, especially before the ninth century or so. You see this in Christology. You know, the Byzantines, in a sense, do sort of strike a balance between diophysite and monophysite leanings. Uh, they kind of come down, not quite in the center, but almost. The canonical corpus of the Byzantine church is a kind of international synthesis. It's got Western elements, Antiochian elements, Alexandrian elements, Asian elements, and so forth. Monasticism, too, uh, there's a kind of combination between the sort of eremitic and more uh, cenobitic, uh, more communitarian uh, developments. Um, you begin to think of these and they're more and more and more. The, the sort of synthesis you see in later monasticism between the intellective and sort of the more heart traditions, which is going on. Um, liturgy, too, of course, is a kind of hodgepodge of different traditions. Um, uh, so there is a kind of strong sense of somehow maintaining a kind of central tradition. Uh, even in modern times, this has survived in the Orthodox world. You see this strongly in the 19th century and also sometimes today in modern um, sort of popular presentations of Orthodoxy, presenting Orthodoxy as that kind of perfect medium between Protestantism and Catholicism, which of course sounds familiar. Um, the Orthodox would seem to be competition for the Anglicans for that sort of coveted slot somehow of being that kind of, you know, that, that, that middle that doesn't sort of have the sort of the, the potpourri of the one side, but it doesn't have, you know, all the extremes of the Protestant either. Uh, that was particularly evident in 19th century Russian theology, Komiakov and others. Um, there's not a sense of compromise here uh, in the Orthodox tradition, uh, but nevertheless, there is a center, there is a sense that there, well, there's just a movement, it's just a reality, there's a kind of central um, uh, trajectory, as it were. Right, so there's just a couple very, very big, very broad things to throw out there um, that I think sort of shape our uh, affinity to each other and our relationship with each other. Uh, just conclude with a few sort of critical comments on where this might leave us today. Uh, I want to start actually with this last point, the problematic one of our imperial heritage. 
The whole problem of the Constantinian heritage of Christendom and establishment, of course, is one of the great issues of our day, and especially now that I think even with the last 30 years or so, we're finally seeing the real dissolution of that synthesis. It's actually finally creaking and crumbling uh, as churches are disembedding from the sort of social mainstream of Western culture. Um, so what to do with that tradition is, I think, one of the key tasks of those of us who maintain a strong self-identity with that old imperial tradition. What to do with it now is kind of our big question. Um, now, I think there's all sorts of things we can say about it. I do want to highlight, I think, one thing that is very valuable about that ancient tradition that's often lost. And I think the Anglicans and Orthodox do share this. Uh, and this is a strong sense of what are called Catholicity. And by that, I mean a vision of the church that is not fundamentally sectarian, uh, that's big and broad enough in its life and message to actually encompass everyone. I mean, credibly could encompass everyone in Canada, in the US, anywhere. Um, you know, you don't have to be uh, a monastic to be a Christian. You don't have to be a super intellectual. You don't have to have a specific experience. Uh, you don't have to have a specific level of moral protection and so forth. You don't have to have certain tastes even. Uh, the church is big. It can, embroad, it, you know, it can embrace everyone. And the imperial church was really good at that, actually. That was one of the things I think that imperial synthesis did quite well. It sort of lacked an elitism. It lacked that kind of sectarian instinct to form Christianity as these little balls, as it were, which push most people out. Uh, today, I think our temptation to become sectarian is actually almost overwhelming. And I think we're seeing that as churches everywhere are intruding further and further into very particular uh, identities. Um, so I would just throw that out as something to think about with that imperial heritage. Uh, we tend to want to just get rid of all of it, but I think there's a few things there that are really, really critical that sense, that breadth of vision. Um, what about our sort of interesting liturgical and almost sort of pre-modern, as I've suggested, diffuse sort of theological sensibility? Uh, here moving forward, I think we have a real asset. Uh, many converts, I think, to the Orthodox Church at least, and I suspect to the higher church uh, elements of Anglicanism, are often attracted precisely by this kind of older grammar of theology, of authentic ritual, of sense of sacred, uh, and this underlying conviction that theology is a kind of aesthetic, literary, polyvalent endeavor. Uh, this offers a kind of refuge, as it were, for this <coughs> sterility of so much modern discourse, including modern theological discourse. Uh, I sometimes feel like today that, especially among our generation, there's almost nothing more dead than a kind of systematic treaties. Because of this, uh, our, our, our traditions, I think, are, are very attractive. Here, however, I think we do need to uh, sound a few notes of caution um, I think in particular about Lex Orandi and Lex Credendi. Uh, this tends to become a kind of very mm, warm and fuzzy concept in orthodox circles. Uh, we like to throw that out a lot. But you know, I have to say, orthodox history is littered with examples of that principle gone very wrong. Um, the problem is, is when you start to attach doctrinal significance to liturgical forms, uh, and particularly tightly attach them, it can be very difficult to negotiate even the most minimal liturgical difference. Um, you know, does a slight change of ritual imply a real doctrinal difference? Uh, in practice, you know, the division between the Western and Eastern Church was largely about this, actually. If you look, for example, I mean, just to give you one example, the 1054 schism, which wasn't so grand after all, but nevertheless, a big moment of fissure uh, between the West and the East, you know, really wasn't primarily about the filioque way or papal, this or that, or big ecclesiological issues. It was about the azymes. It was about whether or not the Latin West was using bread without leaven and the East was using bread with leaven. And we think, you know, it's very funny, but, you know, the way they would develop this argument was it's quite alarming because the East would say, well, the West doesn't use leaven. That obviously means they do not think that Christ had a soul. Bang, you know, heretics. And the West would turn back and say, well, you don't use azymes. That means you're rejecting the Old Testament. You're Marcionites, right? This type of thing builds um, and is serious. I mean, I think we don't, you know, this is, this is Lex Orende, Lex Credende, gone a bit nuts. The best example, of course, is in the 17th century in Russia. Uh, we have an enormous schism where many, many people died, ripped the country apart, ripped the church apart, about very, very small details of liturgy, right? Including, for example, how do you cross yourself? Do you do it with two fingers or with three? 
Now, the reason why I'm doing it with three is a problem, is if you're crossing yourself with three fingers, obviously you are saying that the Trinity is crucified. Right? That's, that's, that's the kind of way you read this stuff. So there's a real sort of lurking danger in that principle that I think we're a little unaware of today. So we need to be careful with that one. There's more we could say about that whole mentality. We'll talk about that later. Um, what about monasticism and the university? You know, this, 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 these, sort of this, these points of big difference. I mean, the place and role of monasticism today in the Orthodox Church, um, it's actually a quietly very controverted topic, but quite quietly. Um, it tends to get presented either as a great strength or as a great weakness. I will say simply that, again, it is very hard to find committed Orthodox Christians that have not had some profound experience uh, of monasticism. It's just very, very, and monastic theology and so forth. And again, it's often the um, sort of trappings of the monastic theology that is attractive to people coming into orthodoxy. On the other hand, I have to say, though, that actually tension and even resentment towards monasticism, and particularly its dominance since about the 16th, well, 14th century, um, is actually fairly widespread within the Orthodox Church. Um, it's seen as unduly setting an often impossible or inappropriate standard for all Christians, denigrating marriage. Uh, there's concern for excessively long liturgies that don't fit with secular life, uh, impossible fasting regimes, um, maybe a certain anti-intellectualism, uh, a kind of competition with the secular hierarchy, and so on and so forth. So, Asset liability, it's, it's difficult to say. I suspect monasticism will start to take a different form, but we'll see. Uh, universities. From an orthodox academic's perspective, it's hard not to do anything but admire, I think, the uh, apparent sort of easy converse between the church and the academy uh, in the Anglican church. Uh, I'm, of course, I'm sure there are problems. You know, I'm sure there's a, a degree of maybe obscurantism or antiquarianism that can que creep in, uh, perhaps too much introspection and so on. Um, but I think as we're moving forward now, it is really hard to imagine a healthy form of Christianity that doesn't have a real, living, vibrant relationship with the mainstream world of thought, belief, and so on. This has always been an aspect of the great church and of the imperial church itself. Um, and so I think that this is quite um, valuable. Um, I do think that the ambivalent and sort of neurologic relationship between orthodoxy and the academy uh, is therefore a bit of a weakness today. Um, there's many aspects of this. But looking to our needs now, I think one of the things that we, we really need, I think, moving forward, I mean, in our generation, I think you know, there's one thing that people do really, really want in church and churchmen and doctrine and so on. And it's sort of a sense of mm, reality, being real, the authentic. Um, and I think one of the problems in orthodoxy is that because we have not developed a strong academic tradition of self-criticism. We don't have a culture of criticism, I think, in the way that other churches have. Uh, it's very easy for us to sort of present things in a way that can be a little deceptive. Uh, let me just give you an example of this. It's very interesting when you read Orthodox theologians. They will very frequently not locate their trajectory of thought in the broader world of thought. Right? So you might have a, a theologian who is, in fact, deeply, deeply engaged with Heidegger. But he doesn't start by saying, I'm deeply engaged with Heidegger, here's all the problems of Heidegger, here's all the other theologians that talk about Heidegger, boom, 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 boom. Instead, there's a tendency to just sort of talk in that mode, and that is orthodoxy. So it's all of a sudden, sort of, you know, existential personalism is orthodoxy. Then you'll find someone else who will do the same thing with sort of counter-reformation type stuff. Um, that's a very common um, uh, phenomenon. Uh, someone else will be uh, deeply engaged with Wittgenstein, but won't mention Wittgenstein, you know. Uh, so this is this kind of this not talking, as it were, with this broader world, which I think really is uh, increasing. It can give a kind of propagandistic uh, element to our theology, which I think is a danger. Um, I think in the interest of time, I will stop there. Uh, these are many of my intention today to sort of throw out some points for you to start thinking about. Uh, and perhaps we can pick up things uh, this afternoon at three.